Romans, chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Burkett notes, the apostle, having asserted the doctrine of original sin in the former verse, he prosecutes and pursues it in this and the following verses, asserting that it is evident all have sinned, because sin is always in the world, not only after the giving of the law by Moses, but also before, even from the beginning of the world to that time. As if the apostle had said, there was certainly a law given before there was a law written, a law given to Adam before a law written by Moses. Now, this law was either the law of nature, written in Adam's heart, or the positive law of God, given to Adam, against which law men were capable of offending before the law of Moses was written. Otherwise, sin would not have been imputed to them, for sin is not imputed where there is no law. Learn hence that God, having created man a rational creature, capable of moral government, is by immediate resultancy his king and governor, and has ruled him from the beginning by a law, yet not barely by a law, but by a covenant with promises and threatenings annexed, rewarding him for his obedience and punishing him for his rebellion. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the solemnitude of Adam's transgression. Burkett notes, the apostle had asserted that sin was in the world before the written law of Moses. Here he proves it thus. Death, the wages of sin, did reign in the world, and had power over all mankind from Adam to Moses. Therefore, sin was in the world from Adam to Moses. By them that have not sinned after the solemnitude of Adam's transgression, infants are generally understood. The guilt of Adam's sin is imputed to them, else death could have no power over them. The argument runs thus. Death is a punishment of sin, but infants die who never sinned, actually. Therefore, they die for Adam's sin. Sin brought mortality into their nature, and the wages of sin is death. They brought a sinful nature into the world with them, which God gave the Jews of an old intimation of by appointing the sacrament of circumcision, signifying that infants brought something into the world with them, which was early to be cut off. He also signifies with the same to us Christians by appointing the ordinances of baptism for children, which he calls the laver of regeneration. Now a laver supposes uncleanness. What is pure needs no laver. Learn hence that infants, as soon as they live, have in them the seeds of death. Sin is the seed of death, the principle of corruption. God doth infants no wrong when they die. Their death is of themselves for they have the seed of death in themselves. All death is the wages of sin, and therefore can be no injustice to the sinner. Thus death reigned from Adam to Moses, yea, even to this day, and like an insatiable tyrant will continue to reign and slay universally and beyond number, from the infant to the aged, from the dunghill to the throne, sparing neither age nor sex, neither great nor small, neither sacred nor profane. Verse 14 continued, Adam, who is the figure of him that was to come. Burkett notes, From hence to the end of the chapter, the apostle enters upon a comparison between Adam and Christ, whom he here calls a figure or resemblance of him that was to come, that is, of Christ. As Adam was the root of sin and death to all his natural seed, so Christ is the root of holiness and life to all his spiritual seed. As by the first Adam, sin, and by sin, death, came upon all men, so by the second Adam, righteousness came, and by righteousness, life, on all believers. As the first Adam merited death, so the second Adam, life, for all his offspring. Thus Adam was the figure of him that was to come. Verses 15 through 17. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by that one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. 
For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one, Jesus Christ. Burkett notes, the apostle, having noted the parity and resemblance between Christ and Adam in the foregoing verses, here he observes the disparity and differences betwixt them, and that in several advantageous particulars. One, he compares the sin of Adam with the obedience of Christ, and shows that the sin of the one was not so pernicious as the obedience of the other was beneficial. Christ's obedience being more powerful to justification and salvation than Adam's sin was to death and condemnation. For if the transgression of Adam, who was but a mere man, was able to pull down death and wrath upon all his natural seed, then the obedience of Christ, who is God as well as man, will be much more available to procure pardon and life to all his spiritual seed. There is a further observable difference betwixt Adam and Christ, as in respect of their persons, so in respect of their acts, and the extent of their acts. Thus, Adam by one act of sin brought death, that is, the sentence of death, upon the whole world, all mankind becoming subject to mortality for that one sin of his. But it is many sins and many men which Christ doth deliver from in the free gift of our justification, absolving us not only from that one fault, but from all other faults and offenses whatsoever. Learn thence that the obedience of Christ extends itself not only to the pardon of original sin in Adam, but to all personal and actual sins whatsoever. 3. The Apostle shows the difference betwixt them two, that is, the first and second Adam, as in respect of the effects and consequences of their acts. If by means of one man, and by one offense of that man, the whole race of mankind became subject to death, then much more shall they who are redeemed and justified by Jesus Christ be made partakers of everlasting life, wherein they shall reign with him in glory. From the whole, note the infinite wisdom, transcendent grace, and rich mercy of God to a miserable world in providing a salve as large as the sore, a remedy as extensive as the malady, a sovereign antidote in the blood of the second Adam, to expel the poison and malignity of the sin of the first Adam. O oh, happy they who, having received from the first Adam corruption for corruption, have received from the second Adam grace for grace. Verses 18 and 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Burkett notes, Observe here how the Apostle informs us of a truth which all the writings of philosophers never acquainted us with, namely, the meritorious imputation of Adam's sin to all his posterity, that all mankind sinned in Adam and became obnoxious to death, and all other calamities and miseries as a punishment for their sin. Yea, the writings of Moses himself, though they declare to us the sin of Adam, and that his sin was punished with death, yet that by his disobedience all his race and posterity were involved, and became miserable, is a truth which we are particularly beholden to, the gospel, and particularly this text in context, for the more full discovery of. And the account of that matter seems to stand thus. The rebellion of the first man against the great creator was a sin of universal efficacy. It derives the guilt and stain to mankind in all ages of the world. And the account which the scripture gives of it is grounded on the relation which we have to Adam as being the natural and moral principle of all mankind. As the whole race of mankind was virtually in Adam's loins, so it was presumed to give virtual consent to what he did. When he broke, all his posterity became bankrupts, there being a conspiracy of all the sons of Adam in that rebellion, and not one subject left in his obedience. Add to this that Adam is to be considered the moral as well as the natural principle of mankind. The first covenant made between God and him, Adam was considered not as a single person, but as caput gentis, and contracted not for himself only, but for all his descendants by ordinary generation. His person was the root and fountain of theirs. 
and his will the representative of theirs. From hence his numerous issues became a party in the covenant and had a title to the benefits contained in it upon his obedience and was liable to the curse upon his violation of it. Upon this ground it is that the apostle here in this text and context institutes a parallel betwixt Adam and Christ, that as by the disobedience of the former many were made sinners, so by the obedience of the latter many were made righteous. As Christ in his death did not suffer as a private person, but as a surety and sponsor representing the whole church, in like manner Adam in his disobedience was esteemed a public person, representing the whole race of mankind. And by a just law, it was not restrained to himself, but as the sin of the common nature. But adored, forever adored, be the wisdom and goodness of Almighty God in providing a remedy which bears proportion to the cause of our ruin, that as we fell in Adam, our representative, so we are raised by Christ, the head of our recovery, which two persons are considered as causes of contrary effects the effects of sin and righteousness, condemnation and justification. For as the disobedience of the first Adam is meritoriously imputed to all his natural posterity and brings death upon all, so the righteousness of the second Adam is meritoriously imputed to all his spiritual progeny to obtain life for them. As the carnal Adam, having lost original righteousness, derives a corrupt nature to all that descend from him, so the spiritual Adam, having by his obedience purchased grace for us, conveys a vital efficacy unto us. That same spirit of holiness, which anointed our Redeemer, doth quicken all his race, that as they have borne the image of the earthly, they may bear the image of the heavenly Adam. Verses 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that as sin is reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Burkett notes, the law entered that sin might abound. That is, before the law was written, we became obnoxious to death by one man's disobedience without much sense of it. But after the law was given by Moses, sin did more clearly and conspicuously appear to be sin. Its odiousness and ugliness was more manifest to the conscience of the sinner. As a sinner has abounded in sin, in a way of commission, so sin doth by the discovery of the law abound in the sinner's apprehension, in the sight and sense of it, upon the conscience of the sinner. Nevertheless, as sin abounds, great does much more abound. As the exceeding sinfulness of sin is manifested by the law, so the superabounding grace and pardoning mercy of God is redounded gloriously conspicuous in and by the gospel. That as the power of sin appeared in making us liable to temporal and eternal death, so might the power of grace appear in beginning in us a spiritual life here and bringing us to eternal life and glory hereafter. In short, when the apostle says that the law entered that sin might abound, he did not mean to make it abound by encouraging the sinner to the commission of it, but by impressing the conviction of it upon the conscience of the sinner. As man without law books took upon himself as a small sinner, but after he has viewed his sins in the glass of the law, he sees himself a great and mountainous sinner. As a star, which a child thinks to be no bigger than a spark, but a man that views it through an instrument computes it to be bigger than the globe of the earth. Lord, help us to see our sins in the glass of thy law, yea, in the glass of thy Son's blood, and then we shall be sensible what an infinite and immense evil sin is, namely, the stain and blemish of our natures, the disease and deformity of our minds, the highest infelicity of the creature, and the boldest affront that can be given to the majesty of the great and glorious God. Learn from the whole that the riches, the abounding riches, the superabounding riches of God's pardoning grace are manifest in the remission of our sins and in the justification of our persons. As sin abounded, grace doth much more abound. Now the superabounding riches of pardoning grace do thus shine forth. 1. In the nature of the mercy, which is the richest and sweetest of all mercies. No mercy sweeter than a pardon to a condemned sinner. No pardon like God's pardon to a sinner condemned at his bar. 
to and the peculiarity of the mercy. Remission is not a common, but a crowning favor. It never was, never shall be, extended to fallen angels. And it is to be feared that the far greater part of mankind refuse the terms and conditions upon which pardoning grace and mercy is offered and tendered to them. 3. In the method in which pardoning mercy is dispensed, namely through the blood of Christ, that all-sufficient sacrifice and satisfaction by which method God has more commended his love to us than if he had pardoned us without a satisfaction. For then he had only displayed his mercy, but now he declares his justice, yea, cause mercy and justice to meet and kiss each other, to meet and triumph together. For the superabounding riches of pardoning mercy appear in the latitude and extent of the act of grace. Lord, who can understand his errors? Yet the blood of thy Son cleaneth from all sin, great and small, small and great, secret and open, old and new, original and actual, all pardoned without exception. Oh, how well might the psalmist say, With the Lord there is mercy, and with him there is plenteous redemption. Psalm 130. Lastly, the riches of pardoning grace to shine forth, as in the peculiarity, so in the perpetuity of remission. As grace pardons all sin without exception, so the pardon it bestows are without revocation. The pardoned soul shall never come into condemnation. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 53, 10. As the east and west are the two opposite points of heaven, which can never come together, so neither shall the pardoned sinner and his sin ever meet any more. God is said to cast them behind his back. That is, he will never behold them more, so as to charge them upon the pardoned sinner, in order to his condemnation. May our faith, then, both in life and death, triumph in the insurance of this blessed truth, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And as sin hath reigned unto death, even so hath grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives forever in heaven to apply by his prevailing intercession what he impetrated and obtained for us here on earth by his meritorious satisfaction. To this Jesus, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, who hath loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, unto him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.